Let's introduce the idea of a confidence interval, which is something that you see all the time in science and engineering and really just in um, the news when you're reading charts and other uh, visualizations and reporting of data. So what we want to do is estimate the mean from some data set, and we also want to quantify the uncertainty in our estimate. Okay, so since we're collecting data and trying to estimate the mean, we know it'll never be perfect, but we want to give a quantitative answer for how close it is to the truth. Okay, and the way that we do this is we say we have some IID data, x1 through xn, and they have some mean mu, which we don't know, a confidence interval, which we write as AB, so it's this interval from A to B, and we are thinking of A and B as random variables here. So a confidence interval for the mean mu with confidence level written as one minus alpha is something such that A and B surround the mean with probability one minus alpha. And A and B are allowed to be functions of the data, and that's why they are themselves random. So what I want to do is get an interval that captures the mean with probability one minus alpha that I'm going to decide. To be a little bit more concrete, usually what we're doing to estimate the mean is using the sample mean. Okay, so I just take the data and average it. And then the confidence interval, this AB, will always take the following shape. It'll just be the sample mean minus epsilon and the sample mean plus epsilon. And I need to properly select this epsilon to get the confidence level that I want, which I'm writing as one minus alpha here. So it turns out that the probability that this confidence interval minus, or this confidence interval, which I write as mn minus epsilon through mn plus epsilon, I can just flip everything around by uh, subtracting mn plus mu from both sides and multiplying through by minus one, then I actually can rewrite it. So what I'm really asking about is the probability that the sample mean lies between mu minus epsilon and mu plus epsilon. So basically, what's the probability that the sample mean is within epsilon of its true mean? And we want to approximate its probability distribution as Gaussian based on the central limit theorem to make our life easier. So we are basically assuming that what we're seeing with the sample mean is a Gaussian centered at mu, and we want to select epsilon to make this area one minus alpha. Okay, and we're gonna choose that one minus alpha. The number I want you to have in mind for this one minus alpha, which we'll see more in the examples, is something like 0.95 or 0.99. So 95% confident or 99% confident that the sample mean interval captures the true mean. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is build a confidence interval for the case where we believe we know the variance in advance. Okay, and this sometimes happens. I'm collecting some IID data, and I believe that in this setting, I know the variance to be sigma squared, and I want a confidence interval for the mean with confidence level one minus alpha. And again, if the one minus alpha is bothering you, just in your head, think of it as like 0.95. So the first thing I'm gonna do is from my data, calculate the sample mean, which is just the average of the data. And I'm tacitly assuming here that I can approximate it with a Gaussian with center mu and variance sigma squared over n because that's the variance of the sample mean that we saw in an earlier video. Okay, so my job is going to be to take that distribution and choose epsilon so that one minus alpha, my confidence level, is equal to the probability that mn falls in this interval. Okay, that's what I wanna do. I could also use this complement property to write it as one minus the probability it ends up on the left of the interval or on the right of the interval. And I'm going to, just by symmetry, set each of those to alpha equals to two. And if I do that, then I know that the area in the middle will be one minus alpha. So this is all I'm setting out to do. So I'm trying to figure out the probability on the left here by this Gaussian approximation. I'm just gonna just use the phi function. To get that, it's just mu minus epsilon minus the mean mu divided by the standard deviation, which is just the square root of sigma squared over n. Okay, and that ends up being phi of minus epsilon root n over sigma, which is just q of epsilon root n over sigma. And that's just the standard complementary CDF, which you can look up. Okay, by symmetry, the right tail is exactly the same. 
And so what we're really trying to do is find um, the epsilon such that Q inverse applied to alpha over two satisfies this equality. So I want epsilon root n over sigma to be equal to Q minus Q to the inverse of alpha over two. Okay, so overall, I get a confidence interval, which is just sample mean minus epsilon up to sample mean plus epsilon. I choose epsilon like this. And that gives me the confidence interval that I wanted. And my confidence level is this one minus alpha that I picked. Okay, and so again, that could be something like 0.95. And so then I'm just plugging that number in to solve for alpha. In MATLAB, this Q inverse function, I can just get by calling Q func inverse of Z. Okay, well, what if I don't know the variance? What I need to do is also estimate it from the data using the sample variance. To do the analysis though, I need two new families of random variables. So the first one is if I have Z1 through Zn, which are IID Gaussian 0, 1, and I square them and add them up, the resulting random variable we call chi-squared with n degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is just a definition. I need this new family. It has a mean of n, a variance of 2n. Its PDF looks something like this. So it starts at zero and then it has this hill and goes down. Sometimes by shorthand, we write as y, the squiggle of chi squared um, sub n. And the CDF is something that we have to work out using a lookup table, or in our case, usually software. Okay, and another distribution we need, if z is Gaussian and y is chi squared with n degrees of freedom, and y and z are independent, then w, which is z times root n over y, that has what we call a student's t distribution with n degrees of freedom. And the backstory behind why this is called students is really interesting if you care to look it up. But we're not gonna talk about it here. So the mean is zero. The variance is n over n minus two for n greater than or equal to three. Turns out to be infinity for n equals one or two, but we're not gonna use it in those cases anyway. And the PDF sketch honestly looks pretty much like a Gaussian. It just has a kind of heavier tail and it's symmetric about zero. The shorthand we might use from time to time is to write it as t sub n. And the CDF is something that we again evaluate using a lookup table or modern days software. And it converges to a Gaussian CDF as n goes to infinity. Okay, so basically it um, has a heavier tail for finite n, but if you drive n to be larger and larger, then the Gaussian is a better and better approximation. Okay, well, how are we gonna use these distributions? Well, we're gonna use it first to come up with a confidence interval for the mean when we don't know the variance in advance. Okay, so the way that that's going to work is I'm gonna have my data and I don't know the mean and I don't know the variance. So I wanna calculate a confidence interval for the mean, but along the way, I need to figure out an estimate for the variance. And my confidence level again is this one minus alpha. So we're gonna calculate the sample mean with by averaging the data. And I'm also going to calculate the sample variance by using this one over n minus one and then summing up x minus its mean squared. Okay, so I have my student's t distribution approximation. I wanna choose epsilon such that the probability that um, I land in this interval is one minus alpha. And so that just means uh, by the complement property, controlling the probability of this left part and this right part so that those are both equal to alpha over two. So it's the same thing we did before. So you can show, and we're not gonna do it here, you can see the lecture notes, that if you take root n times mn minus mu over root vn, that has a student's t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom, not n, but n minus one, if x1 through xn were indeed iid Gaussian, okay? so. Anytime you see this kind of confidence interval being used, and it's used a lot in practice, there's a tacit assumption that your data is Gaussian. Now, it may not be Gaussian in practice, but still we end up using this because we're assuming that it's a pretty good approximation. And so here I'm writing things as if this, this assumption is exactly true, but in practice you would just kind of tacitly take it to be true. And if you really knew that it wasn't true, you could come up with a different way of calculating confidence intervals, but this is the most common way that people do it. So what you do is just try to bound this orange area 
by multiplying and subtracting. So I get the shape of this thing that I had up there that has a student's t distribution. And then I just work out the CDF for this term. And that ends up being alpha over two. And the other side follows by symmetry. So basically this thing that I did here is I subtracted mu from the left and the right, multiplied by root n and divided by root vn. And then that ended up being the CDF evaluated for a t distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. And I just plugged into that. So overall, what I get is a confidence interval for the mean. Okay, and I pick epsilon in this particular way. And that minus sign is kind of important. You'll see if you try out some numbers. And um, it has confidence level as I set it, which is one minus alpha. And again, if you were trying to remember what this could be, it's like 0.95 or 0.9 or 0.99. And again, we can call MATLAB this T inverse function, plugging in the number of degrees of freedom and minus one to get our value if we want. So the last thing what we're going to do is calculate a confidence interval for the variance. Maybe what we're interested in knowing is what is the variance of our uh, data. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take our data and instead of trying to calculate a confidence interval for the mean, why not for the variance as well? Okay, we still want confidence level one minus alpha. So we just follow the same process. We calculate the sample mean and we also calculate the sample variance. And we do that exactly as we did before. The only thing that's gonna change is since we're after the variance is we're gonna to have to deal with a different distribution. So we're gonna pick beta one and beta two so that the probability that beta one times the sample variance up to beta two times the sample variance captures the true standard deviation. And I want the probability that it captures that to be one minus alpha. Then we go through the same thing. We use the complement. So we have the left part and the right part. And then we're going to um, take this left part. And just as we did before, we're going to say that the left part has area alpha over two and the right part has area alpha over two. And if that's true, then the middle has area one minus alpha like we wanted. And again, we can argue, not here, but in the lecture notes, that n minus one over sigma squared times vn has a chi-square distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom if the x1 through xn are indeed iid Gaussian. Turns out that doesn't always perfectly hold in practice, but we still take it to be a pretty good approximation and use this method in practice anyway. But in this class, we're trying to show you what the underlying assumptions are so that you know what assumptions you're implicitly making when you use this method. So I'm gonna calculate this orange area. The way I'm gonna do that is just by multiplying and dividing so I get something in the form that I had up there. I know that I can now use the CDF of the chi-squared. So I just plug into that and I want that to be alpha over two. For the right tail, I do the same thing, but I need to take the complement before I can get to the CDF. I do that, I plug in, and I want that to be alpha over two. So what I really want is the CDF is one minus alpha over two. So overall, I get this confidence interval where I have to pick beta one to be n minus one over this inverse CDF term and beta two to be n minus one over this different inverse CDF term. So I need to calculate two of those but then I get a confidence interval for the variance with the desired confidence level one minus alpha. And in MATLAB, all I need to do is just call this chi2inf function and plug in the number of degrees of freedom as well, and I have my answer for those values. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that as my desired confidence goes up, so if I wanted 0.9, then I can expect a certain length of confidence interval. And if I wanted something more like 0.99, then my confidence interval will get bigger because I need to give myself more room to maneuver so I can capture more area. So I'm giving a less precise answer, but I'm more confident about it. And in the next video, we'll work out some examples.